Hello and welcome back, Eddie Rodosovich, George Stoy here from the Suterscoop.com studios. It's a, another Monday. We got Josh back in Houston HQ and uh, welcome in a game day rewind and the first time in uh, about a month. We could talk about an Oklahoma victory, 59 to 14, your final score on Saturday and ass whooping of, uh, you know, of Maine. And I think before we get into it, we'll put out the disclaimer that I think anybody when you talk about this game has to put out. Yes, we get it. It was Maine, but where this thing's coming from, we celebrate every small victory possible. And on Saturday, you had a season high in yards at 665, a season high in rushing yards, 381, as well as passing 284 yards. Very, very good. Javante Barnes over 200 yards, 18 carries, 203 yards on the day, three touchdowns, 11 carries, 158 yards in the first half. That was the eighth most in OU history in the first half of a, of a game of the 158 yards. But uh, let's start there. Uh, obviously, you wanted to build on something going uh, or coming out of the old Miss game. They played well in the first half, not so much in the second half. Uh, third down conversions, 10 for 14. They also went two for two on fourth down if nothing else josh uh coming out of a 59 four or yeah 59 14 victory on saturday um it's what you needed to do against an inferior opponent in maine and if nothing else maybe oklahoma's found something in the running game here uh moving into the big one coming up on saturday in columbia at 645 on sec network against missouri by itself i wouldn't say oh yeah okay they figured it out in the run game but guys we saw pieces of this against Ole Miss where Oklahoma really did find some stuff. And I, I can't say it enough. Ole Miss is the best run defense in the country. And let, let's not talk about Ole Miss going into Arkansas and just housing Arkansas a week later. So, I, you know, we'll see what all that means. I mean, obviously, you got to be careful with the transitive property and scores. But I, I, I thought there were things to believe in. And the thing I liked most uh, from a team standpoint – they go down seven nothing. I love that you guys in the post game pod acknowledge that we were all like, "Oh God, this is bottom. <laughs> this is as bad as it can get." And because I felt the exact same way, I was like, "Oh no, they're they're gonna really. <laughs> this is gonna be bad." And immediately, Javante Barnes comes out and breaks that huge run. You're like, "Okay, it was a response that I don't know that we've always seen from this team." And I don't, you know, people can say, "Oh, it's Maine." I don't think we would have seen this response against Maine at points earlier in the year. The 74-yard run, the longest uh, for Oklahoma since Ramondre Stevenson had a 75-yard run against South Dakota in 2019. So almost five years since Oklahoma's had a run that long. Obviously finished it up uh, with the one-yard carry to uh, tie the game back up at seven. But... You know, I, for Javante specifically, another just really, really good performance uh, for the Oklahoma running well, back. He's look, been the best. I, I look at that that play there that that just ran. I mean, he's – look at the patience. I remember watching Great this one run. in the press box where he's just waiting for it to develop, sees the hole, and hits it. And, you know, something with Javante that we've seen kind of throughout his career, and I, I think he's starting to really find his stride, is that he sometimes runs to contact or he tries to um, run over people instead of just – Hitting a hole, hitting a hole, making a guy miss those types of things, and I think these last couple of weeks you're starting to see he's still a very physical runner. That's going to be a part of his game, uh, running through tackles and things. But I do think he's starting to maybe be a little bit more patient, Josh, and kind of see things and let them develop. And that's something that you can kind of build on moving forward. Uh, absolutely, and I literally right before we started recording, guys, I was you know obviously doing the Monday morning idiot as always. And was going through on that that play the second the I was about forty five yarder there that he has that we were talking about when George started talking. You can watch him and he kind of sidesteps. He waits for a second and the twenty four. If you guys you know anybody listening, go back and watch it. Obviously, once you're done with the game day rewind, uh, go back and watch and you can see the safety thinks the play is so slow developing. Like Javante waits it out so long that the safety guesses that the, the ball actually went backside, that Jackson Arnold kept it and went the other way because he literally turns his body away from Javante Barnes. And then by the time he does and figures out that Barnes does have the ball, Barnes is past him and racing up the sideline. It is, again, it's Maine. Like these are the things, these are the, the breaks you get when you're playing against a lesser opponent. It is. But at the same time, you're dead on, George. Javante, for so much of his career, has 
you know, he's run like a hammer looking for a nail. Like he, he's just trying to find something to hit. And I think over the last few weeks, I don't know if the light's gone on. I don't know if he's gotten more comfortable or if it's just finally he's getting to run in space from time to time. But you're seeing him make some moves. And, like, the thing I love is he still doesn't waste any time. He's not a dancer. He wants to get upfield. He's going to make one cut, and then he's going to do whatever he's going to do. So, I again, I don't know that this is, oh, Javante Barnes is now this guy. But I do think it's a real positive for Oklahoma as they head down this stretch of, you know, obviously three huge games for Oklahoma. He's also just healthy. I sure. think that's a huge part of yeah. it. Like, you can see he looks like he did his freshman year where he's hitting holes hard. He's making good cuts. Like, the speed is there. Like, on the, I, I know he ended up getting caught on the 74 yard run, but the speed is there. Like, he, it's, it, he's not going to be, uh, you know, Gavin Sawchuck fast uh, necessarily or some of these other guys, but he definitely looks as fast as he's ever looked in his career at OU. Pretty good outing for the Oklahoma running back core of uh, Javante Barnes. Taylor Tatum goes 10 for 50 on the day, uh, had the one touchdown, as well as Jackson Arnold, who goes 9 for 46. He was 15 to 21 through the air, 224 yards. Obviously had the big throw to J.J. Hester in the 90-yard touchdown, longest by an Oklahoma player at the stadium in the history of OU football. Uh, two touchdown throws on the day. Also had the one to Caden Helms, which is a great story in and of itself. Uh, just in terms of Jackson Arnold, Josh, what'd you make of uh, his outing against Maine? Guys, more than anything, when I watch Jackson Arnold in this game, I, I thought it was easily the most comfortable I've seen him. And I know, again, the preface of everything is it's Maine. I understand that that had a role in it. At the same time, it looked like an offense that was suited for him. He was making quick decisions. It's one of the few things that Wow, Rod Gilmore got right in that broadcast. I don't know if you guys have gone back and listened to that yet, but that was a that was a nightmare. Um, but he was right in that they were getting the ball out quickly. He's making fast decisions. It was very, if not A, then B, and then if if C, get out. You know, like it, it, and I, I thought they didn't try to reinvent the wheel because it was Maine. I thought they accepted like, okay, there's no reason for us to slow him down on what we're wanting him to see, what we're wanting him to do. Let's keep it moving because next week against Missouri and then against Alabama, against LSU, the, the clock isn't going to slow down for those guys. So we might as well just keep it moving at a, at a pretty brisk pace. So I, I thought he looked really comfortable. I thought he made good decisions. And, guys, we talked about it. I, I Talent was never the problem. I didn't even know if scheme was totally the problem. Obviously, though, there were some things here that looked much better than what we saw at points in the year. What I do think we're seeing, I think we're starting to see his confidence return. He's starting to play like a guy that believes he can make plays again. Josh, I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned the scheme. Is it something they're doing schematically that's allowing him to maybe get quicker in his process? Are they simplifying things? Or is it just simply he is just starting to really develop and get more comfortable in what they're asking him to do? Well, I definitely think it is helping him that the run game is starting to find some life. Yeah. Um, they are doing some things that are it, – it's just making linebackers hesitate. Like, all of a sudden, okay, you know, Jacob Jordan's open at the second level because the linebacker had to respect the play fake. Like, they had to worry about that RPO where at points early in the year, you know, Tennessee – Tennessee couldn't have been less worried about what OU was doing in the running game. Like, they were like, uh, okay – probably the biggest danger you have is hitting Dion Burks or doing something like that. So I think that's a big part of it. But at the same time, I can't tell you what it is that has him playing with more confidence. Maybe it's Kevin Johns. Maybe it's having a guy he can really go to and talk to about like what I'm seeing, what I think, like, you know, what I, I, I don't know like that. That's really hard because we don't know exactly where that line was and who he was going to early in the year for those kind of answers. Um, I mean, we assume it was Seth Luttrell, but Seth Luttrell not being a quarterback's coach, uh, I, I think something gets lost there. And we, we talked a lot about that kind of stuff. So I don't know that there's any one thing. I, I will say it seems more and more like they are going back to the RPO stuff. And that's what they spent all offseason working on, guys. They look more comfortable, just not just him, the entire offense. Again, we'll put out the disclaimer. We know it was Maine. 
But <laughs> for the eighth time in uh, nine games, Oklahoma did have a different offensive line uh, or starting offensive line. Troy Everett at center, uh, Fabechi, Weiwu, as well as Heath Ozida. And then uh, Logan Hallen and Spencer Brown ends up getting the start on Saturday. We'll see what the uh, you know the situation is with uh, Jake Taylor going into Missouri. We'll see what the situation is with uh, – who am I forgetting here? Uh, Mark, Michael Tarquin, who obviously uh, had the boot on uh, during the game with the ankle injury uh, sustained last Tuesday in camp. Uh, let's start with the starters here on the offensive line, and then we'll work our way back because I know that we want to talk about all the young guys that got into the game. But what did you think of uh, the starting unit? I, I guess, in a way, it was a step in the right direction just in terms of no sacks on Saturday after allowing, uh, what was the number, 25 in three weeks uh, it's a little bit different when you step back into SEC play, but what'd you make of the starting unit? And then we'll get into uh, some of the young freshmen that uh, saw the field on Saturday as well. Guys, the thing that I notice is all of a sudden guys are starting to hit their assignments. Like, okay, this is where he's supposed to be. This is when uh, they're on. Um, I believe it was the play before the JJ Hester, um, uh, the, the the big touchdown pass. You can watch Logan Howland where he picks up the defensive end and Maine brings a safety on a late blitz. And Logan Howland, you can watch him. He's got his outside arm. He's free, and he's got his inside arm, and he's driving the defensive end towards Heath Ozida at left guard. And as soon as that safety comes in, he releases that guy to Ozida, kind of gives the bump. So, okay, now I'm free. And he picks up the safety, and it's a clean pickup. It's exactly what you're looking for. And you're like, okay, the, these guys are figuring this out little by little. And it's not like, you know, it's not one of those things where you can say, oh, this is Maine, because it's about your assignment. You're doing the things you're supposed to do. You're where you're supposed to be. Now, do those things get harder to accomplish against better opponents? Of course they do. But you know where you're supposed to be. And I think you're starting... I know everybody, you know, after the Ole Miss game is, oh, Logan Howland, he's, you know, he's not any good. He's got this problem, blah, blah, blah. I thought he cleaned that up. I didn't see any of that problem. Now, again, we'll see what it looks like when the water gets deeper, but I, I like it. And guys, I think Heath Ozida is starting to come on and play some pretty good football for Oklahoma. I agree, Josh. I, I thought Logan Howland and Heath Ozida, again, played a really good game against a, an inferior opponent, but the more reps you can get those guys, I think it was Logan Hallen played all 80 snaps for Oklahoma offensively. Heath Ozada played 72 of the 80 snaps. That's valuable because like Josh is saying, look, they're not going up against the best athletes, but uh, they are able to get a bunch of real live reps in, and, and that's valuable. I want to ask you, Josh, about the other guys because I looked up. The fun part. Yeah, the, in the second half, and they've got Eddie Pierre-Louis in there. Autry Dent is in there. I think Josh Iasosa maybe played late in the game. I think they at one point Daniel had five. Daniel Akakumi got in there. I th yeah, I think they had the five quarter. freshmen in at one point. I, guys, I, I, I'm not any more, uh, I'm not any different than anybody else. I love the personal foul. <laughs> I don't yeah. care. Like, I, I, I don't care. Guys, that's, to me, like, when you look at it, that's the next step for this offensive line. As they start to, uh, and I mean for the young guys, like, they as they start to figure this out okay now we know what we're doing we're not the scared lambs anymore we know where we're supposed to be i know what i'm supposed to you know move off to my my secondary block where i gotta move move up to the second level go get the linebacker like they, they're starting to figure out the timing the pace of those things okay now you got to start playing with some aggression you've got to start dominating guys it's not just about you know, and I know um, it's a term, you know, I know Gabe Eicher likes a lot. I know a lot of guys like it covering up like they're just getting to the block they're supposed to be to and they're there. OK, that's that's where you got to start from. Like that. that's this is we know where this offensive line is coming from. You've got to start with the basics and then build. So now can you start playing with some violence? Can you start dominating people? Can you start pushing people around? That's that next step beyond just being functional. And again, I, I hate to laugh at functional because we've seen a lot of dysfunction. So you, you got to take what you can get. But I do. I think you're starting to see some good things. The young guys, uh, again, Eddie Pierre-Louis plays with a violence and aggression that this offensive line needs more of. Like, I, I hope that as Bill Bedenboe and the offensive staff is going back through tape this week and, you know, talking with these guys about it, saying, hey, look, 
this guy, he's going to come start taking snaps from you guys if he's the only one that's going to play like that. We'll start talking, uh, you know, big picture wise as Oklahoma moves into the final three games of the regular season. You got a big one coming up uh, on Saturday, a winnable game, if you will, uh, when you head to Columbia. In in terms of what we've seen here now under, uh, I guess it'd be eight quarters under Joe John Finley. Is there something you can build off of uh, from the performance on Saturday headed into Columbia where you're probably going to need to score some points if you want to win the football game? Guys, I, I think there is there's real stuff to build on, I, I, especially with the way. Obviously, Sam Franklin had the fumble. I don't think we'll see a lot of Sam Franklin against Missouri. Um, so now Xavier Robinson. Speaking of young guys, I'd like to see a little yeah. more of. I'd, I'd be interested in that possibility. Um, but I, I do think there's stuff that they can go forward with. They are starting to figure out some stuff on the ground. Missouri is a good defensive front. Oklahoma's played better defensive fronts. They ran against Mississippi, who is a better defensive front than Missouri. I I, I don't even think there's a, there's a conversation about that. It, it's a bigger, more talented, more physical group that they face in Oxford than what they'll go to Columbia and face. So I, I think there are things they can build on. I think they've got to continue to take care of the ball. And guys, with what we're hearing about, you know, some of the early buzz out of Columbia is things don't look good for Brady Cook. And as many struggles as Jackson Arnold has had at points this year, I'd take Jackson Arnold in a heartbeat over Drew Pine. So it, it, there is there's reason for hope. Like maybe Oklahoma for the first time all year is going to get an injury. Uh, a break? Like, is that is that really a thing? Is that possible for this team? Well, they've had plenty of breaks. It's just been uh, <laughs> like actual bones in the body that have been breaking for them on the uh, the offensive side of the ball, particularly uh, here over the course Which, of the 2024 season. We'll see. Um, you know, I, I asked Brent after the game about Burks and, and Farouk. I'm still a little bit uh, skeptical that we'll see those guys. Sure. I, I don't know. Like, I don't think they practiced a ton last week, and they didn't go through warm-ups, which is usually they go through warm-ups the week before that they're they're going to come back, right. and neither did. Maybe you so, see Farouk travel and suit yeah. out but not participate. That'd be a little bit... Uh, that would be deflating or yeah, yeah. deflating, I guess be, be a deflating. better way to say but it. You never know. You, you know, I'm sure that they're going to, I think those two guys, uh, Michael Tarquin, uh, as well as Jake Taylor, they'll probably try it and practice this week and see, Hey, what is my, you know, level at, uh, what was it that Brent said earlier this year, max volume yeah. what is their max volume at during the week. And then. We'll see. I, I bet they're all listed as questionable, though, come the availability report on Wednesday. We don't have any like solo highlights of them either, but uh, I do think that to be uh, fully transparent about this, we need to at least shout out Bauer Sharp. We've given him a lot of hell for blocking. Thought he had a pretty good day on yep. Saturday against Maine. Now, can you translate that into blocking guys against Missouri? We'll see. But, uh, you know. I we at least got to stop down and give uh, a little bit of recognition there in terms of defensively. I, we talked about it at the very beginning of the program today, Josh. I think we all kind of looked at each other after the uh, the first series of the game. We were like, oh, my God. But they did bounce back overall. Pretty good day defensively for Oklahoma. Danny Stutzman leads tacklers with six. I was shocked to find out that was his first sack of the season. David Stone gets his first sack of his career on Saturday. What'd you make of uh, the overall defensive effort against Maine? I, I thought it was pretty solid, guys. I like that you saw from early on, guys. I didn't even recognize it. Like Jaden Hardy was out there in the second quarter. David yep. Stone was out there in the second quarter. When that game is 14 to 7, I mean, still, you know, is in question as a game with Maine's going to be. Um, so I, I thought that was really telling. I love Jacoby Johnson getting the start. I, I thought, you know, you wonder, is that a reward for him being a guy that, you know, did, made the move to wide receiver, has done everything they've asked him to do? And how much is, guys, we all saw Kanai Walker struggle last week. So, like, is that a is that a product of that? I, I Again, I, I continue to feel like the defense is doing more of what I want the offense to do. We're like, okay, let's get some young guys out there. Let's see what it looks like for next year. Um, I, again, it wasn't a glowing performance. I didn't think the defensive line had anywhere near one of their better performances. Um, th this play right here, that's a great play by Peyton Bowen. But if that's LSU and that's Caden Durham bouncing outside, OU's in trouble on that play. Uh, Jaco Jacoby Johnson, he gets he gets caught inside. He gets caught, you know, he doesn't keep his leverage. And it kind of forces Peyton Bowen to make a great tackle out there in space. 
that he probably can't make against a more elite athlete. So there were holes in this game, and I, I think there's a lot for the defense to kind of grow on. But at the same time, at the pace they've been playing at for you know two months now, having to really carry this entire team, I can forgive against Maine when they're not at you know a hundred miles an hour. Like I, I I can understand it. The one thing I'm really interested in, Josh, moving forward defensively, is who's going to play at Cheetah because. You know, it was Samuel Masigo when Kendall Dolby went down. We haven't seen him as much recently. Desan McCullough's snaps are going up. And then Jaden Hardy played some cheetah on Saturday. I don't know if you caught that, but I thought that was really interesting because he kind of fits more of that style uh, in what you want at that position, which is, hey, he can drop back and, and cover really well. And then he's just a missile coming off the edge. If you were to bring him either in the run game or a blitz package or something, I wonder if we see a little bit more Jaden Hardy moving forward. He would make a lot of sense, and he's a lot more of a like-for-like like with Kendall Dolby yeah. than, than some of these other guys we've talked about where McCullough and Omasigo, I mean, they're they're basically linebackers. You you can, you know, they're both great athletes, but they, they don't have the movement skills, the coverage ability that Kendall Dolby has where Oklahoma could, you know, just – from snap to snap, drop Dolby into coverage, bring him off the corner. I mean, they, they could do almost anything they wanted. And Hardy, though I don't think he's as twitchy as an athlete and as explosive as Kendall Dolby is, I do think he has that same kind of football IQ where he just always seems to be in the right position. He makes good plays. He really is just a guy that can do a little bit of everything. And so that makes some sense to me. I, I know... You know, way back in the in the summer, I had heard Reggie Powers some, yep. and I I think of Reggie Powers as more of a pure safety, I, I guess. But Jaden Hardy, I, I it didn't cross my mind at the time, but it makes some sense the more you think about it. I just love those those three safeties, that trio I and mean, the, uh, the just... OU secondary, and you add in Michael Boganowski as well, who. I think uh, we talked to Danny Stutzman this morning on radio, and it seems like he's kind of learning the ins and outs of like, okay, there's going to be moments where I don't need to just put my body completely on the line, but he's still going through that as a freshman where uh, you turn on the tape, and I think it was uh, maybe the first or second play that he was in and just absolutely lights a guy he'll up play, coming down from safety. It's funny because he, he'll play like five snaps in a game, and like two of them he's just hitting the crap out of someone. Yeah. Like he's just nailing somebody. It's a lot of fun to watch. You don't ever not notice that he's out there. Yeah. You, oh, like It's never like, oh, four snaps went by and I didn't notice him. You see Michael Boganowski. Another really good performance for Eli Bowen as well. I know he was part of the, uh, the package there, but just the stuff that he does out on the corner for a guy, and as you saw right there, like his body – it, it's still surprising to me just how undersized he is and how sure he is as a tackler. He is guys. I mean, I, I was talking about it on the idiot. This is a guy you're going to be building your defense around for the next couple of years. Like yep. Eli Bowen is that caliber of football player. And I don't know that everybody recognizes it yet, but this is a guy. And again, he's got limitations. There's going to be times when like somebody gets him on a jump ball, stuff like that. That's just, that's the way it's going to go. But you can tell you're going to get a lot more good than bad out of Eli Bowen. This is a really smart football player. He really understands. Guys, I, would you say you've watched any of the veteran corners that look as confident as what they're doing and their decision-making when they're out there is Eli Bowen. That yeah. guy looks like he knows where he needs to be every time. One thing to note uh, defensively before we move on. Just sure. As we talked about injuries on the offensive side earlier, Ethan Downs. Yeah, that's that's big going into these final three yeah, games. I do think he'll be back this week. I think it was a situation of he was having some back spasms. You know, he got hurt in the Ole Miss game a little bit. But uh, he, 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 if you would have guessed during warm-ups, I think everybody would thought he was going sure. to play. Like, the he one thing like I hate, play. though, with the back spasm thing is it just seems like that's one of those things. It's a reoccurring thing. Yeah, it can come it back. It just always comes back at yeah. some point. Who knows when that's going to be. Uh, same position and maybe one of the uh, the products or you know one of the benefits of playing one of these games so late in the season against an FCS opponent. What do you think of Taylor Wine on Saturday, Josh? I guys, somebody brought that up to me, and I and I I'll be fully honest. All right, we we have to go back just a little bit because there are people laughing right now about the Ethan Downs thing. We can confirm that Josh does not see color. I rated Ethan Downs in the report card, and I was like, oh, he was really quiet. I just didn't see much. And people were like, he didn't play, well, Josh. There's a reason <laughs> for that. I just saw Trace Ford. I saw Trace Ford, and I just 
wrote down Ethan Downs. Like I Interesting. just there's no excuse for it. I know it, Trace but I is a light skin uh, brother, yes. but I mean I, I don't know if he's yeah. uh, Ethan Downs. I will uh, say light skin. It, those anthracite jerseys though too. It's tough. It's it's tough, especially Brutal. from the press box. Did, uh, it's did like, Sam Stoya have a problem seeing oh, numbers? Because yeah. Edward Osvich, not too uh, pleased with unity I was jerseys. Watching, he hopes they burns them with the uh, the same thing that they I did watched with the, the whole Rough thing, Riders. I watched the whole thing through my binoculars, and I still was struggling to yeah. see who was who. Oh, brutal. Um, but as far as what we're talking about, Taylor Wine, I had to go. Like, when I saw him come out, I was like 44, 44. And my first thought was um, – Brian Bosworth? Oh, the, the big defensive lineman from Minnesota. <laughs> no, that they signed last year, Who again, whose name I'm just – man, I'm getting bad about Connor this. Near. Uh, I don't – I don't – yes, I don't – No. Mistake names. I just forget from last names. Year? Yeah. Um, oh, Gilmore. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, We're right, Gilmore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's what I'm like, okay. Shout out and then I state. watch him, and you're like, man, he's pretty long. He's playing the edge pretty well. Like, you kind of thought, like, okay, there's something here. And I mean, we we all know you guys have told me the stories about him just getting worn out at practice at yeah. times. So, it, it, you know, you're like, okay, kid. Like, he got his moment, like, to get out there and start getting his feet wet a little bit and start growing. But I, I've said it before. There's a lot of potential there, guys. I mean, he's a big framed guy. He's what they're looking for at defensive end. He's got some length to him. Um, if he'll stay the course, I, there's no reason he couldn't be a starter down the line for Oklahoma. And he's got the right mentality, too. That dude, he is almost he's too aggressive. He's a little crazy. Yeah, he's crazy. Like, was it the Temple game this year that he got, yeah, the he got two, two penalties per- on one play? <laughs> yeah, it was I mean, awesome. The guy's got – he's got the right motor, I yeah, would say. No doubt about it. Uh one of the things, too, before we get out of here, Josh, and I don't know, it was something that I kind of thought of on the drive down to Dorman today, so it took me to Monday to kind of bring it up in my brain, but Jaquez Petaway, two snaps on Saturday, and you would think in a game that gave so many guys opportunities, 10 receivers or 10 different people caught footballs on Saturday, he was not one of those guys, and obviously with the two snaps, it just seems like this is a very curious uh, spot for Jaquez Petaway in his career at Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, and George, I know you do the mailbag. I obviously do the board chat on Tuesdays. This is this one of those things where, you know, about this time of year, you start getting the, who do you think might be, you know, looking around in the portal this time? And I again, this is not about inside information. This isn't like I've heard something. It just feels like the writing is kind of on the wall that for whatever reason, he's just not going to crack this, guys. I mean, because Jacob Jordan getting more and more snaps, getting, you know, and, and, and seems to be, earning them it's not like oh he's getting snaps he shouldn't be he's playing good football for Oklahoma so if you as much as they've struggled on offense if you start finding guys who can give you a little spark why are you going to take them off the field you're just not going to do it you don't have enough bodies to do it anyway so Petaway guys the last like I've said it a couple weeks in a row the last thing I remember from him was in the Auburn game when he took that tunnel screen and he went wide and I don't think they've looked his direction again since and that's is that harsh? Yeah, maybe. But at the same time, that pl- that, that's not a two-way option play. You go here. This is where this goes. And if you can't get that right, what can we trust you with? Like that, you know, when you do have to make decisions out there, when you do have to make quick thoughts, I don't know. Can you trust that guy? That, that that's kind of where I'm assuming it's at. And I they know he's extremely talented. It's not a question of talent. I just don't know where he is with his comfort and understanding of what Oklahoma is trying to do offensively. The stage is set. OU Missouri coming up on Saturday, a uh, a massive game. I think that uh, you might have said it in the uh, the war room with uh, all of us at the Scoop crew on uh, Monday morning, George. But it seems like these are very big games coming up, and maybe the biggest game is each game as. Oklahoma gets into the final three. Got to get to bowl el- eligibility, it yeah. feels like. And a tremendous opportunity. We'll keep yep. an eye on the weather in Columbia. I know that uh, I was uh, apprised of that situation, and the rain gear will be back out on Saturday for uh, for myself. To be fair, for people watching, don't listen to Eddie when it comes to the weather. Because you did say on the unofficial 40 last week that 130 kickoff for OU is going to be a nice day, nice e- like, and then it was supposed to rain afterwards. That was wrong. Did it rain during the game on on no, Saturday? No, but it, it would it yes would or have. No, did it rain? Kicked at eleven. I mean, it was. It, they had to <laughs> move the rain? game, Eddie. They had to move the game. It's okay. You were is, wrong on the weather. 
Here, has wait Eddie a second. So I'm getting some breaking news. He's now part of Big Bread, Big Dairy. I'm getting some yes, breaking is, news, Josh. and this is going to come as a shock to a lot of people. But over a 72-hour time period, forecasts do change, George. I'm just saying, Eddie, you seem to panic a lot about the weather before we even get close to the game. That's strike one, bud. And it's only Monday. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for the Game Day Rewind. For Josh and George, I'm Eddie. We'll see you right back here on Tuesday when we hear from Brent Vittables at 1130. We'll be back for a practice report as uh, we get into a big week for Oklahoma and Missouri. We'll talk to you then.